Welcome, and thank you for joining us today as we bring you messages of hope through God's Word. Our goal here at My Church Ministries is to build disciples of Christ domestically and globally by offering the good news. Although we all may have shortcomings, our salvation is forever sealed through Christ Jesus. This message is being brought to you by My Church Ministries, where our motto is, It's My Church, It's Your Church, It's Our Church. We are a nonprofit Christian organization with a mission of building, equipping, and strengthening disciples of Christ for victorious living. Our immediate vision is to accomplish this through online messages, podcasts, speaking engagements, and interviews with God's people as they perform evangelistic outreach. Our ultimate desire is to do God's will as He directs in whatever capacity He provides. Now, let's join Pastor Derek for today's message. Good day, brothers and sisters, and thank you for joining me today. A couple of disclaimers before I start, and the first is that this will be a very biblically informative message presenting some things that you may not initially be in agreement with me on, so I ask that you please stay with me for the entire message to get its full context and meaning. You may want to View it out of the presence of a small children because I may reveal some things that you aren't ready for them to know yet. So that's my warning. Also, as you can hear, I have my four-year-old grandson with me. So you may experience some strange noises in the background and, and he may just pop in without notice. So please forgive me in advance. Well, usually around this time of year, most Americans have been going over their shopping list to make sure everything has been purchased and crossed off. Decorations are in place and the Christmas tree has been topped with a star, an angel, or whatever they feel is the crowning topper. Families are reuniting and songs of the season are being heard all around us. Children are excited as they anticipate a visit from old St. Nick and wonder if they will be getting what they have been wishing for. This is a very exciting time of year, but why? Is it because of everything mentioned earlier or is it because of the true reason for the season? Do we even know the true reason? Or have we gotten so caught up in the materialism that we give it less emphasis? If so, I'm here to tell you that this does not make you a bad person and I'm not being judgmental because I too have been guilty of doing so. I just want to provide explanation of some questions that Christians struggle with this time of year and to make sure that the focus is on our savior, Christ Jesus, even during everything else that is involved. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we celebrate your birth every day of our lives, we recognize you as the light of the world and see the world in the light of the understanding that you give us. As you choose the lowly, the outcasts, and the poor to receive the greatest news the world had ever known, so may we worship you in meekness of heart. May we also remember our brothers and sisters less fortunate than ourselves in every season and not just this time of year. As your word says in Galatians, six, nine, and 10, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. I pray for our hearts to be light and our arms to be open. And in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. As Christians, we are taught the true meaning of Christmas, and that is the celebration of the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we live to be Christ-like in everything we do. But what about when we still desire to give gifts, put up decorations, including a Christmas tree, along with other traditional activities. Is this permitted or not? 
Some have asked questions. And my aim in this sermon, which I've titled, The Explanation of Christmas Celebration, is to provide some biblical insight, including a lot of scripture, that will provide corroboration of what I say and hopefully the answers you seek. Let us begin. Question one, what is the origin and true meaning of Christmas? The origin of Christmas is the Christ Mass, or the yearly church gathering in which the birth of Jesus was celebrated. The Bible offers many reasons for why believers celebrate the birth of Jesus as the true meaning of Christmas. First, the birth of Jesus fulfilled many Old Testament prophecies. And in Isaiah 7 and 14, it notes that, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign and behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. In Isaiah 9 and 6, it adds that, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be under his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Secondly, the birth of Jesus marked God coming to live amongst us, his people. And in John 1, 14, it shares, and the word become, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. The one who made all things came and walked among humanity. And in Colossians 1, 16 tells us that, for by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And thirdly, the birth of Jesus served as a part of God's redemption. Jesus came to earth, lived, died, and rose again to offer eternal life to all who believe. After his resurrection, he ascended to heaven, waiting to return once again for his people. But why did Jesus come to our world? The well, first John four, eight and nine shares, God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Love was what brought Jesus into this world through a virgin birth in Bethlehem. This love also offered us eternal life through faith in him. Though we are sinners, Christ has died for us, offering the greatest gift of all, which is eternal life. The true meaning of Christmas is found in the gift of Jesus coming to earth to offer salvation to all people. Question two, what is the importance of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ? The virgin birth of Jesus Christ is a common emphasis during the Christmas season, but it is important. Why was it crucial that Mary be a virgin when Jesus was conceived and born? Why is it vital that Jesus did not have a biological father. Could Jesus have been God incarnate without the intervention of the Holy Spirit? One reason for Jesus' virgin birth is that it identified him as the Messiah. In Isaiah 7 and 14, it prophesied that a virgin would be with child. And ever since that prophecy, the Jews had looked for that sign. God uses miracles to validate his messengers and a virgin birth is a powerful validation. Another reason for the virgin birth is that having a biological father would have annulled Jesus' deity. He could not have been the son of Joseph and the son of God at the same time. Every person born of man has inherited Adam's sin nature. It was only as God that Jesus could be the perfect sacrifice for sin. So it was the Holy Spirit who conceived Jesus. The virgin birth is also a picture of our role in salvation, which is acceptance. Joseph had no part whatsoever in the conception of Jesus. Mary's role was passive. She merely accepted God's gift. And as Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, the work of salvation is done by God alone. Neither holiness nor salvation can be brought about by the effort of man. There are some who do not believe in the virgin birth. 
Arianism teaches that the virgin of Isaiah 7, 14 should read young woman. And that at some point, God created Jesus. The Ebionites, an early Jewish Christian sect that closely followed Jewish law, taught that Jesus was Joseph's son, his biological son. And because of Jesus' righteousness, God chose him to be a prophet and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. The Gnostics, who believed the physical and the divine could not coexist, claimed that God could not inhabit a material body. Therefore, Jesus only appeared to be human. <laughs> Those who reject the virgin birth also reject the deity of Jesus, the sin nature of man and the inspiration of the word of God. Therefore, a denial of the virgin birth is an antithetical or opposes the Christian faith. God is all powerful. Jesus is God. The Bible is God's word. These are the key points in the Christian faith and they make a virgin birth a very simple matter. Question three, what is the significance of Jesus being born in a manger? <laughs> Believe it or not, Jesus was not born in a manger, which is a food trough for animals. But after Jesus was delivered, his mother did lay him in a manger after wrapping him in swaddling cloths. So why was Jesus laid in an animal feed trough in the first place? Well, thousands of years ago, God the Father promised his son's birth soon after Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. Because sin now created a rift in mankind's relationship with God, we needed a savior who would sacrifice himself as payment for the sins of those who believe in him. To that end, God put a plan in motion that would result in the birth, ministry, death, and resurrection of the only one who could become the perfect sacrifice God's justice and holiness required. When Jesus' mother Mary was pregnant, she was forced to travel to the town of Bethlehem with her husband Joseph so that their family could be counted in a census of the entire Roman territory. This fulfilled the prophecy saying the Messiah would be born in that city. And as Micah 5 and 2 reads, but you, O Bethlehem, Ephrata, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, who's coming forth from of old, from ancient days. Sometime after that, Mary gave birth to Jesus. The Bible tells us that the reason Mary laid Jesus in a manger was because there was no place for them in the inn. A note is that here is that there is, a, there is more than one meaning for the Greek word for inn, which is kataluma. It can refer to a hotel-like residence, but it can also be translated as lodging place. This has caused some controversy as to whether Jesus was born in a house with an area serving as a nighttime shelter or a stable, as many suppose, taken from the fact that Jesus was laid in a manger. Many houses in that day had a wooden or stone feeding trough for the animals that were brought in against the cold at night. If Jesus was born in a house, it is likely that Mary and Joseph were relegated to the lower floor due to overcrowding in the upper level guest rooms. But regardless of the exact location of Jesus' birth, Jesus' first bed was an indicator of his nature and purpose. Rather than coming to earth amidst fanfare and in plush surroundings, the king of creation and God's own son was born among animals, with his very first visitors being lowly shepherds from the fields. This humble king would grow up to one day sacrifice his life on a cross for sinners, rise again, and then return to his father's side in power and glory. Question four, what is the meaning of purpose of a Christmas nativity? A Christmas nativity is probably one of the most recognizable symbols of the Christmas season. The word nativity is taken from the Latin nativus, which means arisen by birth. Nativities are arts, models, carvings, or live demonstrations depicting the night of Jesus' birth. These scenes, they generally contain the same elements. The Christ child in a manger, 
his mother Mary, his earthly father Joseph, shepherds, angels, various barn animals, and sometimes three wise men. St. Francis of Assisi, he created the first nativity scene in 1223 to promote the true meaning of Christmas and worship of Jesus Christ. His idea caught on and, and soon a new Christmas tradition was born. Today, it's almost impossible for one to go through the Christmas season without seeing a nativity scene in front of a church, in a Christmas play, decorating someone's yard, or place in model form on a fireplace mantle. That despite the nativity's popularity, there are a few theological errors in many of them. First, most nativity scenes are set in a stable or cave. While this may have been where Jesus was born, it's just as likely that Jesus was born in a lower level of a home amongst animals who were brought inside for the night. And in addition, the angels that are often shown hovering over the stable in a nativity were likely not there, at least not visible. The angels part in the Christmas story took place in a field where they announced Jesus' birth to a group of shepherds. And finally, although the wise men often appear in a nativity, they did not visit Jesus as the night of his birth. The Magi visited Jesus sometime later when he was a toddler. But despite the discrepancies, the most important thing about a nativity is its message to the world. Because our sin requires a perfect sacrifice before a holy and just God, our Heavenly Father sent His own Son to earth as a man so that He could become that sacrifice. The child who was born to Mary and laid in a manger would one day grow up to die on a cross and rise again so each person who believes in Him may receive forgiveness for sin and eternity in heaven. Question five, is it okay for Christians to celebrate Christmas? There has been a long-standing debate regarding whether Christians should celebrate Christmas. What does scripture teach? First, the Bible recognizes the birth of Jesus as a special event. It was a virgin birth. It was announced by angels, attended by shepherds, and acknowledged by wise men. The fact that both Matthew and Luke share reports of this event noted its importance to the early Christians. Secondly, there is no clear command in the Bible to celebrate the day of Christmas or Christ's birth. While it is expected that Christians would rejoice at the coming of Jesus to earth, it is also not a prescribed holiday. The church's celebration of Christmas on December 25th came later to honor the day Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Thirdly, there are some unwarranted reasons some argue against celebrating Christmas. For example, some argue against the holiday because the date of Christ's birth is unknown. While this is true, not knowing the exact date of Jesus' birth does not mean it is wrong to choose a date to celebrate it. The exact date is less important than the reason for the celebration. Further, some argue against celebrating Christmas due to a pagan or non-Christian influences. Some refer to the early pagan connections, while others argue against the modern connections with presents, Santa Claus, and other cultural traditions. Again, while aspects associated with Christmas may be at odds with Christian values, the celebration of Christ's birth is a positive event and should be celebrated by all believers in Jesus every day. The cultural celebration of Christmas also offers many opportunities to share the true reason for the holiday. Many have grown up with Christmas traditions without understanding the Savior who was born. A proper focus on Christmas can serve as a wonderful outreach to those in one's family or community. In Romans 14, 5 and 6, it offers a helpful principle related to the celebration of Christmas. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day 
observes it in honor of the Lord. There is no command to celebrate Christmas, yet Christmas can be celebrated in honor of the Lord. <laughs> the goal of the believer is to honor God each day, including December 25th, regardless of one's personal thoughts related to practices related to the Christmas holiday. Question six. Was Jesus actually born on December 25th? The birth of Jesus, like I said before, is celebrated on December 25th, but it is this, is this the real date in which he was born? The Bible does not specifically tell us when Jesus was born, meaning any dates proposed for his birth require extra biblical information. The earliest known accounts associated with a December 25th birthday can be traced back to church father Irenaeus, who connected Mary's conception of Jesus with the Passion Week, starting with Palm Sunday. Using March 25th as his Passion Week date, Irenaeus calculated forward nine months to December 25th as a birthday. Hippolytus specifically noted December 25th with the birth of Jesus, though he may have made this decision based on the earlier tradition of Irenaeus. Sextus Julius Africanus noted December 25th as the date of Jesus' birth in the year 221. The influential church leader, John Chrysostom, held to December 25th as well. And Cyril of Jerusalem was a writer who had access to the official Roman birth census and documented the birth of Jesus as December 25th. This date would be accepted as the date of the Western church calendar. The Eastern churches selected January 6th, with other churches selecting various dates between December 25th and January 6th. Biblically, the date of Jesus' birth is uncertain. In fact, we are uncertain even though the year in which Jesus was born. Matthew 2 and 1 tells us Herod was king when wise men from the east came looking for Jesus. This Herod died in 4 BC, meaning Jesus was born by then. Further since, Herod commanded all males two years old and under to be killed after the wise men did not return. This indicates Jesus could have been as old as two years old by 4 BC, giving a window of 6 to 4 BC for his birth. The time of year is uncertain as well. Though some data can help since a census was being taken in, in Luke, second, Luke 2, it was likely after the growing season, indicating a time from fall to spring. Another relevant note is that Jesus was born approximately six months after John the Baptist. And John's father received the angelic visit regarding John's birth during his time of service in the temple. And according to Jewish records, this time would have probably been in early June with Elizabeth, John's mother, conceiving shortly afterwards. This would have placed the birth of John nine months later in approximately March or April and Jesus six months later in September or October. However, we cannot know with certainty, and though it is unknown which day Jesus was born, early believers selected December 25th based on the known information from that time. Regardless of whether this is the exact date, December 25th is now used to commemorate a key date in the history of all Christians, the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. Regarding the shepherds, Luke 2 and 8 tells us, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. The shepherds were not in the town. The flock was not in a fold in or near the town. They were afar in the field or common pasturage. The sheep were taken there only in the winter when the winter rains brought forth grass on the hills, providing those wrong, I'm sorry, proving those wrong who argue that Jesus could not have been born this time of year because the shepherds would not have been grazing the sheep in the fields. <laughs> Question seven. I know it's a lot of questions. <laughs> Does giving gifts take away from the true meaning of Christmas? The real meaning of Christmas is celebrating of the birth of Jesus. We said that many times already. God's ultimate gift of love to the world to save us from our sin. When talking about the tradition of giving gifts at Christmas, 
Many people point to the Magi, which are the wise men, bringing gifts to baby Jesus. Today, in our materialistic, saturated culture, Christmas is often made more about what I get rather than about what God gave us. Millions of marketing and advertising dollars ensure that this is the case. Because let's face it, Christmas is a very lucrative time of year for retail businesses. But just because obscene materialism has become a big part of the Christmas season today, it does not mean that the tradition of giving gifts must take away from the real meaning of Christmas. The key is our focus. It's easy to become consumed with the gift giving aspect because it's such an ingrained part of our culture. But our focus should be on God, who is the ultimate gift giver. When we stop and realize that the birth of Jesus was not just a one-time gift from God over 2,000 years ago, but that it has tangible meaning and impact on our lives every single day in the now, giving gifts to one another can be a natural expression of our gratitude. Ultimately, the question of whether giving gifts takes away from the true meaning of Christmas must be answered on an individual basis. If a person feels like it does, it may be worth reevaluating one's motivations behind giving gifts. The Bible speaks of excelling in, his, in this grace of giving as Christians. And our God is a very giving God. So it would make sense that as his followers, we reflect the same characteristic not just at Christmas, but year round. Question eight, is it okay to have a Christmas tree? Are Christmas trees pagan? Well, some have argued Christians should not have a Christmas tree because the practice is associated with pagan worship. Should Christians have Christmas trees? First, Christians today, listen to me closely, who use a Christmas tree do not use it in any form of pagan worship. Instead, it is part of Christmas tradition, one piece in the larger celebration of the birth of Jesus. Simply having a Christmas tree is not wrong since no pagan worship is taking place. There is evidence of trees or at least evergreen boughs being associated with pagan worship. However, the tradition of Christmas trees began with Protestant Christians in Germany in the 16th century. The star on the tree was used to remember the star followed by the wise men. And in some cases, trees were taught by an angel to remember the angels who appeared to the shepherds on the night of Jesus' birth. Some have wrongly used certain biblical passages to teach that the use of Christmas trees is sinful. For example, Jeremiah 10, 1 through 16 forbids cutting down and decorating trees like people often do at Christmas. Isaiah 44, it notes the futility of cutting down a tree and forming part of it into an idol for worship. Both examples have nothing to do with Christmas trees. Both occurred before the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem and were directed at the nation of Israel regarding worship of idols. They are prohibitions against idolatry, not against having Christmas trees. These are just examples of people taking scripture out of context to make it agree with their personal beliefs or thoughts. There is no biblical command regarding the use of Christmas trees or Christmas at all. As mentioned, the modern practice of Christmas trees associated with the celebration of Christ's birth began only 500 years ago. It is perfectly acceptable for a Christian to either celebrate or not celebrate Christmas and to include or not include a Christmas tree. Of course, this practice is also cultural since evergreen trees are not available for use in celebration in some cultures. 1 Corinthians 10 31 offers some encouraging words that can be applied regarding the use of a Christmas tree. So whether you eat or drink or whether you do, do all to the glory of God. Question nine, how should parents handle the issue of Santa Claus with their children? 
Many parents are concerned regarding what to tell their children about Santa Claus. What are some guidelines to help with this issue? First, it is helpful to know there was a historical figure upon whom the modern Santa stories are based. St. Nicholas of Myra was a priest who lived in the fourth century. His parents left him an inheritance when they died. He was known for giving anonymous gifts and sometimes leaving bags of money in people's homes or even down a chimney to avoid being discovered. Nicholas of Myra died by the 350s. The day of his death became an annual feast during which children would leave out food for Nicholas and straw for his donkey. It was said the saint would come from heaven and leave toys and treats for the good boys and girls. And over the years, many variations of this tradition have developed into Santa Claus accounts, which are told today. But what should parents say to young children about Santa? Some choose to play along and pretend Santa comes from the North Pole on Christmas Eve night to give gifts. Others feel convicted to tell the real story of St. Nicholas of Myra while also including the giving of gifts. Still others prefer to downplay the role of Santa and focus on the birth of Jesus Christ, the true reason to celebrate Christmas. Each parent will need to discern the best way to approach the issue. However, a parent should never pretend to the extent that he or she is lying to their children. First Peter 3 and 10 teaches, whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Of concern to parents is that what may happen when the child feels lied to by a parent? Trust can then be broken, causing trouble in other areas of their life. One helpful approach may to begin with teaching the child about the true reason for Christmas with the account of the birth of Jesus. And as your child asks about Santa, you can share the historical story of Santa as a kind man who gave gifts to others. Still today, those who celebrate Christmas celebrate through the giving of gifts. Each child will then have various levels of questions regarding details of Santa and related ideas. As a parent, there is nothing wrong with this. Playing along with your children or even making a list for Santa. Though the focus is to be on the celebration of Christ's birth and becoming a child who desires to give gifts to others. This focus can help a child better understand the birth of Jesus and the need to live with an attitude to serve and give to others. Celebrate Christmas yourself. Make it a point to remind yourself and teach the real meaning of Christmas in your home and let the joy of Christ's birth shine through in your life. Speak the truth in love. When we allow God's love to flow through us in our interactions with people, the Holy Spirit can minister to them in ways we may not even realize. If you heard this message today, my prayer is that it has been beneficial in your Christian growth. Remember that there is wisdom in the word of God. I don't have all the answers, but he does. I pray that you examine your relationship with God and make sure that he is number one. At my church ministries, we will always offer an opportunity to receive Christ. If you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and would like to do so right now, I would be honored to lead you in the prayer of salvation. There's no better time than right now. It is offered to all, but you must receive Jesus into your heart and follow his commandments by maintaining faith in him. This does not mean that once you receive salvation that suddenly everything will be perfect in your life. It also doesn't mean that you will never make a mistake again. It means that God loved you so much that he sacrificed his only son so that you and I may be saved. Yes, he already knows our hearts and desires, but he requires us to speak to him as a child speaks to his father. 
Confess him as your Lord and Savior by speaking. It's a simple decision, but the most important one you will ever make. And as God works through us here at My Church Ministries, we will work with you and lead you through this momentous moment of your life. If you desire to know him and want to accept him as your Lord and Savior, repeat the following words. Congratulations and welcome to the kingdom of God. If you pray this prayer for the very first time, you have just made the most important decision of your life and we are so very proud of you. But let's not stop there. I pray that you connect yourself with a ministry that teaches the truth of God's word. If you aren't local, please find a church in your area that meets your needs. We would love to have you follow us here at My Church Ministries. If you would like to receive a free certificate of salvation, one that you can put on your wall for all to see, just send us an email at mychurchministriesmd at gmail.com, including your name, address, and date of your acceptance of Christ as your Lord and Savior. Purchase a study Bible and connect yourself with a mentor who not only know God's word, but who is also a living example. God loves you. And we here at My Church Ministry loves you also. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we worship you during this Christmas season. You are our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. We choose to put you at the center of our family as we celebrate your birth. Keep us from distractions and Help us to invite you into all of our family activities. Teach us to pray and help us to glorify and worship you and our family during this busy time of year. Give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation that we might know you better. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. As a reminder, anytime you feel you need prayer, please don't hesitate to contact us because we are committed to you and we thank you for your support. Just message us on Facebook, our email at mychurchministriesmd at gmail.com or visit our website at www.mychurchministries.com. One final question that I have yet to answer and that is, Pastor Derek, will you and Emily be celebrating Christmas? <laughs> well, the answer to that is an astounding yes. We have our family, including our two dogs, a tree, decorations, and gifts. But our focus is not the gifts under the tree, but the gift of Jesus Christ. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And as always, when you hear the name My Church Ministries, remember, it's my church, it's your church, it's our church. God bless you and have a safe and wonderful Christmas season.
We greatly appreciate you joining us today and pray you are blessed by the message. A new message is presented each Sunday at 12.30 p.m. on Facebook and YouTube. Please join us at 6 p.m. on Thursdays for our devotion and prayer. You may also email us at mychurchministriesmd at gmail.com and to donate to our ministry, please visit our website at www.mychurchministries.com where you will find a donate option. We welcome all comments and questions, and if you have a subject or topic you would like for us to discuss, please reach out to us on Facebook, email, or by visiting our website. We look forward to having you join us next time, so please pass the word and we will see you then. May the blessings of God be with you always.